Ecuador questions, Ecuador answers. If someone is planning a long trip to Ecuador, including many regions, what kinds of clothes should they pack to be both weather appropriate and not stick out as a tourist? <sighs> Ironically, this is probably the hardest question out of all the questions in today's video. So to quote my friend Arlette on what she had to say about the situation, it's just that there are people who have different customs, so it's difficult to not look like a tourist. There's a difference in cultures. Some of the things she added was that it's not typical for people here to walk around in sandals, and in that same way, people don't normally walk around with sunglasses. I also talked to my friend Annabelle about this, and she said that it's very typical to see them using a specific type of sandals, as well as a specific type of hat, which I will display in this video so that you can check it out yourself. She also sent me some images of what you could wear to look less like a tourist. But overall, I'd have to go more with Arlette's answer because people do have different styles based on their culture and depending on where they are. Like even in Quito, like I'll let you see some of the pictures and some of the footage that I took while I was in Quito, you could see that there's people who don't necessarily have a very specific type of clothing that they wear. Everyone wears different type of clothing. Of course, since it's Quito though, they do wear more clothing that will protect you from the cold. So that is the difference. And if you wanna know a little bit more about what they wear, I'll show you a little bit of what my cousin wears and some of the pictures that I took of her while I was in Quito. So it's very different depending on where you are and who you are. If you look at some of the pictures of my friends here in Manaví, you'll notice there's a focus on comfort for the hotter weather that we have over here. And it really is gonna depend from person to person because if you look at me, I dress a specific way myself as well. And if you look at some of my friends and even my brother, there are differences in the way that we all dress which you'll notice in all the pictures that you can see on screen now. And Annabelle also sent me some pictures of some sandals that she says are the typical 10-year Ecuadorian sandals that you have like for the rest of your life, I guess. So there are some things that are very common that people here wear. Even the Ecuador shirt itself, if you're wearing that, then you look very much like someone who lives here or who really loves Ecuador. Although for some reason, I would think that it looks more touristy, but you know, People do like to wear that, especially and more so on days that Ecuador is actually playing or one of the Ecuador teams is playing. Then you'll look less like a tourist if you wear it during one of those days. And there are some minor things that might help you avoid looking like a tourist, such as not carrying around a gigantic backpack or not wearing the fluffiest of coats or sweaters or hoodies. And in the coast, obviously not wearing the typical hat that seems to be a tourist common thing and also the sandals that my friend Annabelle actually sent me a picture of that she says that all tourists wear. And as a final thought as for how not to look like a tourist, for some people that might be very complicated because it just doesn't depend on what you're dressed in. It depends on how you look. And some people have the typical, stereotypical appearance of a tourist, which is very tall and very white. And it's not that we don't have people who are very tall or very white here, but most of the time, when someone sees someone who's very tall or very white, they associate that with being from the United States or being from Europe. I don't know if this is interesting to people or not, but I'd be interested in knowing which phrases or vocabulary in Spanish are unique to Ecuador, especially up in the highlands. You get a lot of Quechua words mixed in with Spanish. You make a good point there. Sometimes when it comes to Spanish, it can be tough. But in order to make it easier, I did make a video with Spanish expressions, and a lot of them are Ecuadorian expressions, and the video is called Expressions Used in Ecuador You Need to Know. In that video, me and my friend Kayla tell you about a few Ecuadorian expressions and what they mean. So you might want to check that out. But if long videos aren't for you, then you might want to check out my playlist of Ecuadorian expressions. There's a lot of shorts that me and my Swiss friends made, and recently me and some of my students made, talking about Ecuadorian words or just Spanish expressions that are very useful for people who are here and very commonly used. And it's different from the typical eat, which is comer, or sleep, which is dormir. It's actually going into expressions that are probably less commonly known and will probably surprise people if you know them. Not to mention I try to make them a little bit funny so that way they're more fun and pleasing to watch. So if you wanna check out the video I mentioned or the playlist, I'll leave both the links in my description down below. Are there language exchange meetups or less intensive programs? Now that's, 
That's a question that's kind of hard to answer. My immediate answer is that there are none, at least that I know of. The last time I actually heard of any language exchange was when I was in the university. And that was more for people who wanted to practice English. And even then, when someone suggested it, pretty much no one wanted to do it because no one wanted to spend their time practicing English. Very few people did, but it was more like in the middle of classes, switching from one class to another, just speaking to each other in English in order to practice it. You might find people who are willing to teach Spanish. Even in the academy that I work at, we did have one person who was going there strictly to learn Spanish, but it's not a common thing. There are institutes that are dedicated to it, of course, but finding someone or a group of people, you might have a better time looking on Facebook and just joining a group and hoping that they make a WhatsApp chat. And then through that WhatsApp chat, everyone practicing Spanish together. I have been looking to find even more on transportation. You said bicycles are dangerous because they ride in traffic, but also that motorcycles are good. But how is it different? Also, what about e-bikes or those Vespa-like scooters? Do they need a license plate? Also, how do you keep them safe? if you need to park them and go into a store or a restaurant. Okay, so this is a very transportation question which I can't answer because I ride a motorcycle. So first, the part with the motorcycles and the bicycles, there's a huge difference between them. You can't compare a motorcycle and a bicycle and say that they're the same just because they have two wheels. With a motorcycle, it's supposed to be on the street, in the middle of the street. With a bicycle, if you see that in the middle of the street, there's a good chance that the person is just very careless or has no regard for their life or they just assume that if someone hits them, it's gonna be that person's fault. Which isn't fair to drivers because they're the ones who are actually supposed to be in the middle of the street. Because when I say that they're in the middle of the street, it means they're not using the bicycle lane, which in some cities doesn't even exist. Even here in Puerto Viejo, bicycle lanes have just started to be an actual thing, like a good thing, like a noticeable thing. Because before, they just weren't around. And if they were, they were in very specific places. And even now, they're still in very specific places, but a little bit more spread out than they used to be. And if you need more reason as to why a bicycle shouldn't be in the middle of a street, you have to notice how people drive here in Ecuador, which is still very surprising to some people. But people here drive very quickly. And if you're a bicycle in the middle of the street and a car drives by you very quickly, the wind from the car is more than a gentle breeze. It is definitely enough wind that will push you or knock you off your bike, and then there could be a lot of trouble that could happen there. Now, when it comes to the e-bikes, I'm not sure if you're referring to the electric motorcycles, and those do exist. My best friend Nacho actually recently got one as a gift from his girlfriend, and it's really cool, <laughs> first of all, I gotta say that. It's a small, lightweight, and it seems to go pretty quickly, even though you would think it wouldn't. And they do need license plates. It's like an official vehicle that you need to enroll every year. Now, as for keeping something like that safe, I guess it depends on which vehicle you have because each vehicle requires a different level of safety. When it comes to cars, obviously you can probably keep them safe just by parking them in a place that you can see them because that's enough for you to be able to, if anything happens, call the police. And most of the time, if it's in a very visible area, at least to you, no one will do anything to it. For everything else that's not a car, that's where you gotta be cautious. Motorcycles are typically parked in places where you can actually see them and get to them very quickly. So that way no one tries to take it because there have been cases of people driving by in trucks, throwing your motorcycle in there and it's gone. The same thing could or would happen to an e-bike or an e-motorcycle, electric motorcycle, if you tried to leave it somewhere where it has no security or no one's looking at it. Which is another important thing to note even for cars, don't ever leave your vehicle in a place where there's no one, that no one can see it. Don't just leave it there. You have to park it in a place where someone can see it and it is very visible, at least to you or to the people who are taking care of it. There are also designated parking areas for some places, such as the mall or like El Shopping. They do have a place where you can park and typically those places have guards that look out for your vehicle. But in other places, there are no designated areas so you have to be careful where you park your vehicle. There are also some places that have close to them a parking garage where you could leave your vehicle and they'll charge you like a dollar an hour depending on your vehicle and depending on the area and of course depending on the city that you're in. So there are options, but it's a good idea to before you go to the place, 
you look around and see if they have good parking areas or see if you need to leave your vehicle parked in a place where someone can take care of it. What are some of the best apps to use while visiting Ecuador? And Robert has given us some options. Apps for food delivery, taxi apps, of course, what's up or what's app, communication apps, I'm assuming, perhaps dating apps, ooh, dating apps that aren't actually hookup apps. So starting off with the food delivery, it's not as set in stone as you would think. There are two apps that are mainly used, which are Pedidos Ya and the app called Rappi. And both of these apps, they work in conjunction with places like malls and shopping centers. But there are alternatives if you don't want to go through an app. For example, the case of small businesses, like a random restaurant that might be out there. For, as an example, my dad's restaurant, Gonzo's Chuzo's, they don't work typically with these companies. They have someone who will do the deliveries for them, a specific person. So with some restaurants, you might want to check in with the restaurant to see if they have a delivery person or a number where you can call them through that number and they'll send you someone to deliver your food. With taxi apps or transportation apps, the main one that everyone knows about is Uber. But Uber is only a thing in big cities such as Quito or Guayaquil. On the other hand, in Puerto Viejo, we have InDrive. And other cities might offer InDrive as well, but you have to check in with each city to see what app they offer. As for communication apps, as Robert said, WhatsApp or WhatsApp is probably the most common one. But there are three communication apps that are commonly used here in Ecuador, which just for the fun of it, I'm gonna call the Triforce of communication apps. And these three apps are WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram. And while WhatsApp might be a given, for some people it might be uncommon that Facebook is among the communication apps, but there are people who communicate through Facebook, through posts, or through different types of groups or chats that they have. Some people actually do use Messenger here even though I've heard it's become uncommon in places like the United States. And in the States, I have heard it's more common to use Snapchat anyways. Another app that I've noticed has slowly started gaining popularity is Telegram. Though I feel that most people download it just to use it for businesses, or some people just download it due to the, to the hype, due to it being trending for now. Well, over here in Ecuador, of course. Now, as for dating apps, the two most common ones are probably Tinder, and Facebook dating. And out of the two, the one that's definitely used the most is Tinder. Unfortunately, it is used a lot of the time for hookups, but I have heard some meaningful relationships come out of Tinder. And I do know there are other dating apps such as Hinge, but I tried that out too and didn't get too much results out of that one in comparison to Tinder, of course. Tinder, there's a lot of suggestions while in Hinge, it felt like after three or four suggestions, it just stopped recommending because there was no one close enough in my area to be recommended to. But that could obviously be solved if you buy a premium account, which I wasn't looking to forward to doing anyways. In your opinion, or your father's opinion, if Luisa wins the presidency, will the 2.5 billion she says she will use to infuse the economy help to create more and better jobs? Ooh, that's a very political question, and I wasn't planning on answering political questions today. But let's leave this as a bit of a accountability question. So that way, if something gets resolved with this, we can go back to this and see what actually happened. So first, I wanted to know where she would get this money from in the first place. And this article in La Repubblica talks about the 6.96 billion that Ecuador had in the international reserves as of June. And then it mentions Luisa injecting the economy with the 2.5 billion, leading me to believe she plans on taking the money from the reserves and while that may sound good, since the money is going into the economy, some of the debate around that is that it would hurt Ecuador since those reserves are what hold up Ecuador's economy. Then, after talking with my dad, he told me he was watching a debate with the new Congress. And one of the Correismo congressmen made a mention that the money would be taken from businessmen who had their money in paraísos fiscales, which are translated to be tax havens. The problem with that is that there is no guarantee that they'll be able to get that money from them, which leaves the proposal sounding more like a conditional sentence, which is basically, if I can, then I will. If I can't, too bad. 
Now, if we look at the presidential debate that happened the week before the August 20th elections, there was a part where Luisa was asked about the subsidy on gas. And she went on to mention the following. El gobierno le dio dignidad al sector del transporte. Aún con los subsidios la economía crecía. Pero una de las propuestas fue hacer la refinería del Pacífico que ustedes y sus gobiernos destrozaron y no dejaron que avance. Vamos a hacer esa refinería, ese proyecto petroquímico que nos permita generarles a ustedes puestos de trabajo, que el dinero que ahorremos... ¿Qué va a pasar respecto al subsidio de combustibles? ¿Los va a mantener o no? So basically what she talks about is that with the refinería del Pacífico, or Pacific Refinery, that the previous governments didn't allow to advance, she would be able to generate work and savings. But then she was cut off because her answer didn't have anything to do with the question. But with that, it can also give us an idea that part of her plan is to use the refinery and maybe even the construction of such as a means to generate more work. While that does sound great, there is the risk that to finish construction of the refinery, it may put the country into more debt. And as I discussed with a friend, what's the point of more jobs if the country just keeps sinking further into debt and the economy just keeps worsening? But of course, nothing is guaranteed and there might actually be other methods or other places that Luisa might actually be taking this money from. If she does manage to take it from a good place and get good amounts of money, there's no doubt that Ecuador will be able to have better jobs and more jobs, which right now is what people need. And if you were wondering if you could get a job here in Ecuador, I actually did answer that question in my previous Q&A video, which is right here. And you should definitely check that out next. Make sure you take care. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And as always, ace out.